So um, artificial intelligence have recently gained a lot of attention, right? Um, with a little bit of exaggeration, I think I can hear AI and machine learning, you know, a thousand times per day in the news, in the newspapers, or TVs, and so on. As you all know, recently there was a historical event where machine actually beat our human champion in the Go game, which has been considered very hard to do. There was also news newspaper articles about the machine that can diagnose the cancer even with the slightest hint in the image of the medical image, right? And there was also, there is also software that can trade a stock and make money out of it. Indeed, AI is in your computers and smartphone as well. Whenever you browse the website, some of the apps sites actually try to predict your interest and come up with some product that you might be interested in buying, right? In all of this area and other areas, including the autonomous vehicle, the AI is now really making a huge impact in our life. So I also want to bring your attention to another exciting technology, which is called Internet of Things, or IoT. The essential idea of IoT is to attach a small computer onto everyday object. And by doing so, you can include the object into the traditional internet. With this capability, what you can do is, you can actually monitor, control, and observe a lot of things. For example, you can see the temperature of your refrigerator and also change it. You can turn it on, turn it off, your light bulb in the house while you are traveling. You can also make sure that there's no water leak in your water faucet in the sink. AI and IoT, what would be the answer? I believe the answer is smart things. In fact, we're already seeing smart things in our life. The best, very good example is the smart speaker. This speaker can detect human voice in the noisy environment and do something for you. Detecting a human voice in a noisy environment sounds like a very simple task to us, us meaning human. However, for machine to do that, the machine must acquire a knowledge or an idea. What makes human voice different from all the different kinds of noise? This knowledge is technically called a model, or more specifically in this case, model that detects human voice, or human voice detection model. And the process of training this model, making this model, is called machine learning. Our research team at Columbia University have recently developed a very low-power voice detection system. And that system has this voice detection model. And you can see that the graphical representation of the model in the screen. Essentially, the model is a collection of mathematical formula that you're going to evaluate again and again with a new input to see whether there's a voice or not in the ambient sound. There's a lot of exciting application in smart things. When one of the, my favorite is actually smart factory, which consists of a lot of different smart things. For example, in the smart factory, you can imagine a robot that can fetch the parts that you need upon your voice command. You can also consider a tool such as welding machine that can not only do the welding, but also monitor the quality of the welding real time and report 
the quality of the job to the users or the operator or the supervisor to make sure that welding is perfectly done all the time. This type of capability improves the productivity of the factory while reducing the cost of operating the factory. So let me switch a gear a little bit here and tell you a little bit about how we can actually make the smart things uh, today. First, what we're going to do is we're going to use a very powerful cloud computer to build a model. And this model will be deployed onto the small mobile device, like your smartphone. And finally, with this model, your smartphone can detect your voice and other intelligent things. To do an intelligent task is actually not simple. For example, if I want to make my smartphone to detect a specific keyword, let's say happy, or any other keyword that you can imagine, it actually requires to compute roughly 5 million multiplications and 5 million additions. Moreover, you have to do it every 100 milliseconds. So this is non-trivial workload, even for the very high standard of the smartphone that we develop. And I just told you that the model is all trained in the cloud computer, right? However, it would be even better if a mobile device can train the model in field locally using the all interesting private data. So like this. And after that, all these models trained locally in multiples of these mobile devices can be unloaded, unloaded to the cloud computer and the cloud computers combine all of them and make a great model. And apparently, you're going to download this model to the, all the smart devices so that they can do job more intelligently and more accurately. But training is not that easy thing. Let's say I want to make a machine that detects a frog in the picture, right? Uh, that task roughly involves to analyze the one picture. However, if I want to build a model that detects the frog, that requires to analyze, let's say, about 50,000 images over 100 times. It total 5 million images. So there's an order of magnitude difference between post-training intelligent work versus training. So in order to really enable these smart things, we must address this computational complexity problem. So let's go a little bit deeper um, and see how computer, computers actually do the computation. Let's consider this simple equation, A plus B is the C, right? So first step, computers actually do this in two steps. The first step the computer must do is data movement. What that means is they grab A and B from the memory and move all the way to the input of the another hardware called arithmetic unit. And after this, computers actually perform addition and produce C. So that's the whole story. Right? But the problem is actually in modern computer systems, moving data is way more expensive than actual do computation. This is because the memory and the computational elements are physically separated. Transmitting the information over a distance, whether it's micrometers to millimeters or centimeters, takes time and energy. So this problem called memory world problem has been identified about 20 years ago by Professor Wolf and McKee. And what they observe is the speed of the processor increases much faster than the time to get the data from the memory. And this difference for now actually 
decrease, increase the difference of the speed by roughly 100 times to 1,000 times. So memory wall problem is very fundamental problem in today's computing system, any computers that you have, laptop, smartphone, PC, servers, anything. So this is the very fundamental problem that we need to solve. So basically, we want to reduce this data movement between memories and arithmetic unit. So there's a roughly two different approaches, in my opinion. The first approach is to use a small memory in the arithmetic unit. Indeed, there is a small memory embedded in the arithmetic hardware. The key challenge is this memory is not large enough to fit all the necessary data uh, that you want to use. So the key design goal would be to make sure that uh, use this embedded memory maximally so that we can reduce the data movement to the outside large memory. So toward this goal, um, our team at Columbia University recently developed a new deep learning algorithm called recursive binary neural network. So this learning algorithm goes through the mainly three steps. First, training. Second, knowledge consolidation. So I'm going to compress the knowledge. And after that, I'm going to use the space that I just make. And I'm going to repeat this multiple times until I reach it to the target accuracy of the model. So this model maximally uses the embedded memory that is embedded in the arithmetic unit, so you can reduce the data movement to or from the large outside of the memory. And this basically translated huge energy savings and the speed up of the training process. The other approach that we can consider is somewhat similar to previous approach, but a little bit different. So what we can do is basically this so-called in-memory computing. So what that means is, instead of uh, transmitting all the raw data, we can actually do a little bit of computation inside of the memory, so compress the data and pass it to the arithmetic unit so that we can reduce the data movement. To do so, we have to add a small hardware in the memory that can do a little bit of arithmetic operation. And this must be chosen very carefully to support your prepared algorithm very large, in a big time. So in this score, our team, in the collaboration with the Arizona State University, uh, develop and prototype a new memory hardware that can actually do compute inside it. The name is called uh, XNOR SRAM, and we add a small computational element that can do this so-called multiply and accumulate operation. And multiply and accumulate operation is the fundamental, very basic, massively used computational corner in deep learning as well as the deep neural network. So having this memory hardware, we can actually transmit much smaller amount of data because we already compute the value and the result will be passed to the arithmetic unit. And this again translated about two orders of magnitude improvement in terms of the speed as well as the energy dissipation. So, I would like to conclude at this moment. Thank you for your uh, listening to my talk. The future of AI is actually not small, it's bright. And one of my, uh, what needs to be small? The AI size needs to be small so that we can fit it in the smart things. So that's all. This is Mingu Sok from Columbia University. Thank you very much. <laughs>